October 2017. It is also block height 489,570. This is Block Digest coming at you live from all over the world. I'm in Berlin. Where are you, Rick? Still here in sunny Colorado, man. Things are looking pretty. How's things over there? Yeah, really nice, actually. Really good day. Just came back from the Monero meetup and uh, lots of images on Twitter to show you all. Room Shinobi. 77? Yeah, Room 77, man. All about that place. I would consider moving to the city just for that one bar. I'm not kidding. Such a good crowd in there. Really, really bustling as well. Monkey, how, you, you've only just woken Hello. up. You've only just woken up. You're the reason we're late. I can't believe it. He you just, you just stays up. I go to bed, right, like at somewhat reasonable hour. He's online in the chat. And then I wake up at like, you know, pretty late, so I like to sleep in a bit. And he's still chatting away. It's like he never stops all night. And I'm like, monkey, what time is it where you are? And it's like, I don't know, like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. or something. That's not unusual, is it? I'm sorry. Sometimes later, right? Sometimes you don't even go to bed until like the afternoon. Anyway, we also got Acnix. Come yeah, on. and I, I also have grapes with uh, Shinobi. And, and I wake up this morning talking to Shinobi again. I'm like, wait, did you yeah. Yeah. get some sleep? <laughs> no, exactly. And a lot of us are communicating to you right now by our mobile phonic devices. And you could probably, I'll probably make a game out of it. If you can guess in the chat which one of us are coming from our mobiles, I'll be very impressed because I'm super impressed with the quality of LTE these days. Uh, Janine, where are you coming from? I'm coming from the room next door to you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Both in Berlin right now. And uh, okay. So should we get started? Shall we get started? Today was a really entertaining day. We're yeah. going, to, going to bring you what turns out to be an exclusive story because nobody else has really covered this um, in the press. But this is the story about the SEC talking about Bitcoin. And it was kind of being reported, you know, a little bit on Twitter, um, also a little bit on our Bitcoin as well. So guys, did you manage to see it? Who, who among you actually managed to watch it live? I watched it. Yeah, I, uh, I ended up uh, watching the whole thing. Oh, cool. Okay. So I, I also saw part of it. I didn't see all of it because I had to, to dash out to the Monero meter, but I did see this. And this chap was just like the most annoying person. What was his name? I even like signaled to him on on Twitter. Uh, Damon, Damon Silvers, I believe. Right, right. And yeah, so he was just giving this guy a really hard time on the left here, um, Adam Ludwin, who's like an entrepreneur in the space and just like, he kept on asking like, are you a lawyer? And Adam would just like not say anything. And he was like, but I, and then he would like try to do, he's like, you're giving me marketing, right? Right now what I'm hearing is marketing. I want to understand Bitcoin from a legal perspective. Can you give Chris, me- Chris, are you a contract? Are yeah, you a contract, yeah. Chris? Are you a contract? And he said, he said something about, um, and then Adam goes, well, like, yeah, are you a contract? Like, is this a contract? He was trying to say, this SEC guy, right, this guy here was trying to say that, that cryptocurrencies are a contract because when you, you know, you download the software, you're basically uh, agreeing to these implied terms. And uh, he saw it as an investment, a security. All cryptocurrencies are securities, essentially, because you're profiting from the effort of others. He cited some case. Uh, you know, so-and-so versus so-and-so from 1960, whatever. And he said, you know, the definition of security is very broad and all cryptos basically are covered under it. And then the uh, one of the actual lawyers stepped in, there was this lady from Yale, and uh, she said, well, look, if you can give me a definition of a security, I will try to answer your question. And he just said, well, I'm sure there are some people in this room that can give you the actual you know, legal definition of what a security is, but, you know, and then he just kind of bumbled along. But yeah, he was just being an epic troll. And uh, he, you know, I wasn't that impressed with Adam, to be honest. I didn't think he put up, you know, I think all of us in the chat room were screaming, like, put me in this room now. Like, I could answer these questions better, right? Yeah, I mean, they even elaborate further on in the uh, 
the the, the meaning of that um, there's maybe one lawyer who can actually parse all of the legal code. And there's this kind of uh, issue there where they're requesting access to kind of more of the backend data just so that they can try to attempt to figure this stuff out. Uh, so it seems to be an interesting battle. Yeah, I mean, I thought, it, though, you know, that that said, you know, obviously they were a little uh, under-informed on the, the technical or rational side. I, I was actually relatively impressed with, with the nature of the arguments they were making. I, I think, you know, they still had a, a big way to go, but they had a lot better grasp of things than, than I thought they would, considering the environment they were in. Yeah. Yeah, was I was actually sort of uh, impressed with... Um kind of the SEC meetings I've seen in the past to this one. It seems like there's been a lot of market change and uh, more of a kind of um, gumption just to make it work. Yeah, there was also this guy here. Um, I put the link in the description below. You can um, watch Joel. This is Joel from the SEC, Joel Parker. And uh, he's talking about DLT. He's talking about, you know, Blockchain is an abstract noun, Shanine, you would love it. And uh, you can actually look him up on the SEC website. Uh, Joel Parker, Senior Assistant Chief Accountant, uh, works in Office 9, Beverages, Apparel, and mar Mining. So I see why they might have, uh, you know, put him into a blockchain uh, committee. If he's, like, into mining, I guess, they, they just were looking up certain keywords and just thought, yeah, why not? But, yeah, so you can see that. I thought that, by and large... It was, you know, with the exception of that one guy who was, you know, trolling the panel and he he basically had like made his mind up going into the to the conversation and was then just trying to, you know, just badger the witness into saying what he wanted them to say. And I didn't feel like it was constructive. It wasn't really being argued from logic. Blake Anderson was also with us listening to it at the same time in the chat room. And um, yeah, we just weren't very impressed with that one guy. Yeah, but otherwise, it was he, a very... He was ridiculous. Like, uh, what was it? He said that um, the the only financial innovation since the Renaissance is the ATM. Right. Um, did, right. did he forget triple book accounting? <laughs> right. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't impressed with him at all. Um, but there is also in the description below, you can see a summary of it on our Bitcoin. Somebody posted a summary. So you can see it there. And um, I can take you through it now. There was general enthusiasms about blockchains, DLT. All parties agreed that they were there were some real world use cases. Um, also, what was mentioned was the fact that the these trustless systems could easily replace clearing houses. That was discussed quite a lot, and there was you know pretty much uh, round table support for for that. That eventually, maybe five ten years from now, that that Bitcoin or some or a version of it will be the backbone for, for clearing. So that I think everyone agreed on that. And then um, if anyone thinks banks are afraid of blockchains, they're wrong. Investment banking believes blockchain will remove some of the complications um, regarding contracts, assets, transactions. There was criticisms of cryptocurrencies, warning about speculators and FOMO. Adam Ludwin gave a technical explanation of Bitcoin, Ethereum, ICOs, FOMO effect that was driving the price of Bitcoin. Uh, Ludwin fumbled very badly when he was asked uh, tough questions about investor protections, contractual obligations, and what legal options do crypto investors have when they're scammed. Exit scams were briefly covered. Ludwin said that during the dot-com bubble, exit scams were pulled at a, large, later, at a large, later stage after product launches failed. Now exit scams were pulled off before a product even exists. Generally, everyone agreed there is a bubble, including Ludwin himself, um, who has been very supportive of Bitcoin. So... That's a summary of it. Um, I don't right now have not been able to find a, a recording on the internet. There was just a live stream. That link is now dead. It no longer works. So if we find it, we will update you um, and you can go back and watch it. I highly recommend it. Any final thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, because I missed the conference, and I noticed Acnick said that, you know, it came from like a different light this time. And uh, when I was trying to find some information on it, the earliest thing I saw was talking about how the SEC's position before this was really just hands off of Bitcoin and crypto in general. They didn't really want to touch it. And then it's just really, I don't know, I find it comical that this guy's saying, you know, don't bring in technical jargon when trying to describe Bitcoin. It's, it's like... Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, they're uh, 
they're changed their attitude about it and they know they've got to adopt it and form some sort of regulation for it. But uh, I think this is still just like, they're still pretty ignorant to the fact of what it is and what it does. Yeah. All right. Segwit to X, the saga continues. It's just the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, F2 pool deals possible death blow to Segwit to X fork withdraws support. Check it out. That tweet from Jameson Lop. I actually saw it when I was in uh, room 77. Monkey. Come on. I love Wang Chun. Come I love on. Wang Chun. It, it, one thing I, I do, I do have to take an opportunity to shit on Cointelegraph. Um, they withdrew their support a while ago. They just didn't want to reboot their server uh, to get rid of the Coinbase signaling for no reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, oh, okay. um, this so is... all they did was basically remove the, the signaling in, in the Coinbase transaction. Mm -hmm. Wang Chun um, really actually cool. kept his word. Um, it's it's yeah. kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also, you know, featured this story mostly so that I could just, you know, feature this kind of artwork um, because Shanine sent me this over DM. And never fork without consensus and crypto rape. Always use protection. No 2x. And uh, <laughs> you also get this one. Bitcoin levers never rush to fork. How about that? So some good apparel there. Great. Yeah, maybe Joel from the SEC can get in on this since he's like into his apparel. That's a lol. So there you go. All right. It's the day of the freaking memes. <laughs> yeah. And so it turns out that BTCE won't be supporting um, this, uh, you know, Segwit2x hard fork. After the news about Segwit2x proposal, they say the Bitcoin's hard fork. The cryptocurrency platform Wex.nz declares it will not support the division for Bitcoin's cryptocurrency into competing chains. New trading pairs will not appear. The management of the exchange consider the results of this division to be questionable, both for trades and for the cryptocurrency system as a whole. During the hard fork, trade on the platform will not be interrupted and will work on a regular mode. Sincerely, Wex team. There you go. So the new suited and booted uh, BTC-E, now known as WEX. They still managed to get it in the same font. I like that. So like, you know, good continuous branding. The troll box just isn't the way it used to be, though, is it, guys? Do you find? Hey, there's still a troll box. There Sweet. is still a troll box, yeah. But it just doesn't got the same old people in there. They all moved. So BTC not supporting it. Blockchain, though, on the other hand, are encouraging users to buy Ethereum if they want to make transactions near the date. Is that right, Shani? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a bunch of people have uh, already pointed out that um, they're not, they haven't used blockchain.info in a long time. And uh, they recent blockchain.info recently added um, uh, support for Ethereum, I think. I don't know how long ago that was. Um, but yeah, they're saying that uh, in order to avoid uh, transaction difficulties or whatever during the fork, that they recommend people just buy Ethereum and then they can keep transacting, which I think is a little weird to them, for them to request people. Well, it's a great way to pump Ethereum's price, but I don't know if they've checked the Bitcoin price recently. It is mooning, is absolutely mooning. And uh, this is actually off the back of the fact that, that Jamie Dimon uh, featured in today's artwork, of course, said that he wasn't going to talk about Bitcoin anymore. Rick, why don't you talk about that? It was you that suggested it, right? That story. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I just, uh, I think it's hysterical because this is one of those situations where somebody who's really prominent in a space uh, puts his foot in his mouth because he doesn't quite understand the upcoming tech. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, let me pull right my notes up on this real quick. It says, uh, you know, the whole time that he was saying this, he says on these quotes from this, I wouldn't put this high of on the, I wouldn't put this high on the category of important things in the world, but I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin anymore. So that was his <laughs> actual quote. And, you know, that's, there it is again, he doesn't understand it saying it's not really highly important for the world. 
And then uh, the CFO of JP Morgan, though, goes on to say, we are open-minded for digital currencies that are properly controlled and regulated. And, you know, they already, they're part of that uh, Ethereum, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. They formed that and uh, partnered with Zcash. And, you know, they're doing a lot of blockchain work over there at JP Morgan. And, you know, this is Diamond not understanding what is going on within his own sector there. And that's why we did the artwork like that. And uh, just a quick shout out to 8K1309 on Reddit for uh, helping with the idea there with Bob Ross. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, guys. Um, it was excellent artwork for today's show. And uh, yeah, really good collaborative effort. So he's going to shut his mouth now. I mean, it sounds a lot like the Putin thing. Like they make a statement on one day and then the next day it's like, Oh, whoops. And then they, they retract it, but they get a bit of a dip in the meantime. Do you notice that? Oh yeah. You know, he bought that dip. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like Putin bought the dip. They just like yeah, open yeah. their mouths. But his CFO did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, so, so just cut monkey. Do you want to come in? Uh, I was just going to say real quick, like all, all of the, the shit talk in the main media, the, this, this is a bubble, the, this is a crash coming nonsense. I, in my mind, this is just point blank. Big investors and institutional investors want the price to go down so they can get in. And like, I, I've literally had a close friend of mine call me three times in the wee hours of the morning this week to tell me to sell all of my coins because he was worried about me with, with all of this shit in the mainstream news. And then pop, like they're clearly just trying to push the price down so they can get in. <laughs> yeah. They don't get it, do they? We get it because we've been around for a long time, you and me. So we're used to this. But I think a lot of normies, they just don't get it. And uh, this is the artwork I was referring to. Rick did a fantastic job on that. That's actually an amalgamation of a few different images there. You got the bit for next chart on the right, which you actually made yourself, right? Yeah, that's yeah. actually today's chart. So today's that's no chart. Fraud. Yeah, yeah. And then you got Jamie in the background. It's just, just perfect. Really well done. Great job. And I know you put a lot of time into that. Thank you. Cool. All right, back to Segwit 2X. Sorry, I took a bit of a detour there. Um, now, we've got the 16,000 members of the Seoul Meetup Group in South Korea um, have written a letter saying that they are against the New York Agreement and Segwit2x. That's a lot of people. I thought the idea of the New York Agreement was that the businesses signed it and the businesses represented the users, right, Monkey? They So why have we got yep. so many users that disagree with it? Like, I was at the Monero Meetup. There was easily 30 people there. I didn't meet a single person that was in favor of this, the New York agreement. Everyone I spoke to were like, well, well, everyone's talking about it, right? Like, what do you think of this? Uh, what do you think of this fork in November? Everyone like wants to know what everyone else is thinking. And everyone either thought it was like a well, game of just... chicken. I had phrases like, it's a game of chicken. Is it, is it even gonna happen? And just like, <laughs> it's just gonna be complicated. Well, it's just users like we're we're here for monetary sovereignty. Like we're we're here to take responsibility for our own shit and try to get away from all of the custodial gateways <laughs> that pretty much just wreak havoc on our lives. And you know, it's it's not going to be a simple bait and switch to just get us to go along with with a corporate hijacking like this. And people can can stick their fingers in their ear and go la 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 and pretend they don't hear it all they want. But, but at the end of the day, you know, our voices are going to be heard. And if you don't listen, you're just going to get wrecked by the market at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Barker was saying some interesting stuff in the chat earlier about martyrdom. And he said, some, he's like, throughout his whole life, he said that he has always martyred himself for doing the right thing. Like a lot of people say, oh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, blow the whistle on this because it meant I would have lost my job or something like that. But he says like throughout his life, he's tried to be consistent. And even if it means he fucks himself in the process, he will still do what it takes to do the right thing. And I feel like most people in this industry right now, they wake up in the morning and they're not even trying 
to do the right thing. They're not even trying to be decent human beings. They're just like, they're just blown around by the incentives. They're like leaves in the wind. They just get blown around. And then there are some of us that see the bigger picture, that we see the system at a much higher resolution. And we see the incentive structures and we understand how important they are. And when we see people acting in this predictable deterministic manner, juxtaposed with technology, robots and computing and automation, we just see these humans as somehow more like machines and more predictable and less autonomous. You, do anyone else get that sense? Are you seeing it the way I am? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, this is what we've been talking about with like the infighting even within the companies themselves and you know, and then you see this 16,000 plus users coming together to say that they don't support this. And it's just really goes to show that there's a lot of support behind the legacy chain and what is Bitcoin. And, you know, I, I really like their last line of that statement where this could maybe reach out to those other guys. It says, quote, remember, there is no shame in readjusting one stance in light of new information and conditions. Do the right thing. So please, guys, you know, like, I mean, I hope y'all got, you know, everybody understands on that side that this is this is a network of users and that's what's important. And it's important to keep those users happy so they keep using Bitcoin. Yeah, that's a really good quote. It's actually 1,600, not 16,000. Just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, globally, um, I think Rick's probably right and <laughs> probably undershooting by a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I think this sums up pretty much how most of the community feel about feel about this whole thing. Um, so, any any final thoughts on Segwit two X? Because I also want to talk about what Bitcoin Core is doing right now to improve scaling, and this is the introduction of Schnorr signatures, which apparently, according to this article in CoinDesk. Um, by Alyssa Hertig, uh, really like her work actually. Um, really thorough article, highly recommend you give it a good read. Um, apparently, so at the moment we're using ECDSA, right? Um, and that means that there's quite a lot of data that, that has to be downloaded and, and validated, but the idea of using the Schnorr signatures is that we can do away with a lot of that signature data. And apparently some of the uh, you know research that was being read on it you know, wasn't very good and then someone came across a paper that was better and actually you know suggested a better way of doing this um, and now again what we have is an improvement to the efficiency of the Bitcoin protocol as a network I should say um, rather than just trying to make the roads wider or trying to build roads to places where people aren't going to go or you know anything just just raising capacity instead they're trying to streamline and make what the, the protocol as it currently is, as efficient as it can be. Monkey? Yeah, it's, this um, is actually... All right, next. Yeah, Negotiate amongst yeah. yourself. Yeah, I was going to... I was going to say, like, it looks really nice. Like, they have their own app sig module to encapsulate, like, all of the Schnorr signature aggregation, which is pretty good. So it kind of, like, keeps it nice and tidy there. So, and overall, this is going to reduce like the amount of just signature data that's going to be contained in each block, which you know is going to help keep the fees down and aids in scaling. And um, you're basically just able to sign more efficiently efficiently for TXs consisting of more than a few inputs. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think it makes sense. And I think that that potentially offers a uh, more interesting things that we can do in the future, maybe regarding UTXO sets and such. Yeah, I mean, it, this really like shows, you know, the the core dev team isn't isn't messing around. <laughs> like uh, Schnorr is actually, um, it's like almost uh, twenty years old at this point, I think. And um, the the only reason that it's not really widely used in uh, cryptographic products is because it was patented and uh, these patents have all started lapsing lately and um, are not being renewed so they're open to public use but it's it's really like um, we have the like EDS or EDCSA um, signature algorithm right now which is widely used in uh, most things and Snore is actually 
just the, the all around more efficient way to do things. But, you know, everybody's kind of had to settle for like the less efficient uh, way of using signatures just because this was patented. And, you know, this is, is really nice to see. Like Bitcoin is going to be, I think, one of the first uh, public open projects to really use the, the more efficient uh, algorithm for signatures. And uh, like, like Chris was saying, when they actually um, took their paper on uh, fraud proofs for aggregated signatures and submitted it to a cryptographic uh, conference and got the, the second paper back that was actually more secure and efficient with this, like th they're not playing around when they're tinkering with, with the cryptographic components of the system. Like they're actually doing their full due diligence and actually reaching out to the, the actual experts dealing with this topic before they start just tinkering with things in the system. Like they're, they're actually taking it seriously. Yeah, cool. And Shanine, did you want to comment on this uh, tweet by Elizabeth Stark? Yeah, so this was tweeted uh, about three hours ago, and I thought we should mention it on the show because uh, basically the Lightning team has announced that they've released a test uh, desktop app. So if you want to try out um, Lightning Network, uh, I don't know. I haven't looked into the details of what it allows you to do or what kind of um, what kind of contributions you'd be making in terms of testing, but uh, definitely check it out because, you know, uh, who was it? I believe it was Mike Belshi a year ago who said that SegWit and Lightning weren't going to be, they like they basically weren't going to have any development for a number of years. They wouldn't be ready. And it's like, oh, look, hey, Mike Belshi, check it out. Maybe you should see how developed it is. Yeah, indeed. And uh, any final thoughts on this? I'm excited to test it out. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah, I am as well. Um, because the transaction that we did at Room 77 took ages because like the confirmation's really slow. They're running this really old app on this old Android phone. It takes forever for them to even get it. I'm like showing them the blockchain, right? I'm showing them like the transaction hash. They're not, they, you know, the guys behind the bar don't always understand the technicals of Bitcoin. So they're just looking at me like a dog that's just been shown a card trick. All right, Equifax. It's a it's another gag that just keeps on giving. Shanine? Yeah, I feel like I tweeted this earlier, but I feel like Equifax is trying to write the script for the ultimate infosec horror movie just in time for Halloween because <laughs> all they need they've already had shit credentials like admin admin for a password to one of their portals. They've had a multinational data breach. By the way, um, the number of UK citizens affected is now in the double digit millions, not hundreds of thousands. Uh, so it's significantly more people. Uh, they also, what else did they have? They had the, uh, they had you using your uh, social security number, which is supposedly been compromised as a way to log into their credit monitoring service that they've been offering. And now they have a apparent attempt. Uh, it sounds like uh, they web their new website's been hacked and someone has been serving fake flash updates <laughs> through the website. Uh, so basically all they need to make this script more exciting is to add some kind of ransomware botnet with IoT devices running Windows 7 or something. And then you'd have the ultimate InfoSec horror movie. Uh, so this, uh, the, uh, the hack was apparently discovered by this guy, Randy. Oh. Randy? And yeah, yeah, sorry, it's this, can't hear anybody in the back. I thought I froze for a second. Um, so yeah, it was discovered by him. Uh, and I he said, uh, let's see, I'll read it. Um, so he said that he used a number of different uh, uh, virus detection software like uh, Panda, Sem Semantic, and Webroot, and they all labeled it as adware. So it might be some kind of malvertising attack. But yeah, it just shows, you know, I mean, the only thing worse than getting flash updates is getting fake flash updates. So uh, I think this is just another, you know, nail in the coffin for Equifax, because uh, if you can't even, 
you know, protect your own website from something like this, then I don't know what you're doing on the back end with all of the uh, the rest of the data that you're trying to gather and protect. Yeah, that just being yeah, like no, no. Go on, Agnes. Yeah, like how can you maintain data integrity? <laughs> if you're not able to do the data science, how are you going to protect the the so-called data science? Like, oh, what a mess. That being made to look like complete fools. And I think like every hacker out there right now is just like taking as many pot shots as they can, testing every single vector, every single attack surface is up for grabs. And it's just creating this relentless, uh, you know, snowball of, of releases in the in the media where they just look more and more ridiculous every day and not fit for purpose whatsoever. All right. So the chat room, James Bond says, uh, I thought, yeah, the miners control the network. Well, yeah, the miners are users actually. So I don't know how that really works. So you're saying like miners control the network, not the users. I think you've, yeah, here you go. Miners are more important than users, but miners are users. That is a, you know, they just have, you know, they just have some equipment and they're able to, to do some, some hashing, but they still require propagation on the network, right? That still requires the, the, the transactions to be validated, to be passed along. So um, I think they're both the same thing. And what else have we got? Just a lot of trolling by the looks of it. Should I sell stock of Equifax? Probably, James. Probably you should. I <laughs> and uh, monkeys in there. What are you doing? Oh, do you want me to show this meme? Probably the best I'm meme. Shilling, my meme. <laughs> shilling your meme. And uh, you know, monkey doesn't get paid for this. Um, you know, it's all Creative Commons uh, CC zero license. But here you go. Here it is. That's my meme. That's his meme. That was a good laugh this morning. Thanks for that. Yeah, very good. I aim to please. And uh, Paula is saying that miners secure the network. They do. So do the users. Um, and if the users stop securing the network, the network won't be secure anymore because, you know, who's going to watch the watches? Everyone is responsible for securing the network. Um, and it's, you know, if, if we're not going to bother with validating transactions anymore, then I don't see the point of using a blockchain, really. Like, why bother with mining? If you're going to do away with validating nodes, do away with miners as well, because you may as well just go back to using an Oracle database. We're all just get, all, From now on, we're just going to trust a group of people. Um, you don't need to bother with the mining process. That whole thing can be left out. One of the things that came up in the SEC meeting, actually, was this single source of truth. They actually uh, went back and Wojciech's in the chat and we've spoken about this with him um, in the mumble as well, which is one of my favorite parts of the Bitcoin white paper was this uh, idea that Satoshi puts forward about the longest proof of work chain will be accepted as the truth whilst people look the other way, whilst everyone is kind of going to bed and they wake up in the morning, they need to know. I mean, who really sits there, you know, every night counting all their money exactly so that they know how much is there often you know we put money in certain places we forget that it's there we have to trust the custodians look after us well now we don't have to now we have this mathematical purity in this, this algorithm plus we have a, a global interconnected network of networks called the internet and we have computers uh, that are now pretty much commoditized and we can we can all have computers at relatively low cost so really, you know, yes, Shining, you do count your cash. It's true. Shining loves to count all the cash, but not everyone has time to do that. And in order for me to remember, you know, exactly how much I had at the moment with the custodial model, we have to trust that they're not going to lie to us about what our balance was, right? I mean, how are you going to know? You're going to keep track of everything. I mean, you just trust that your bank isn't lying to you. Your bank could be taking a penny a day out of your account, but you wouldn't even notice, would you, right? Whereas with Bitcoin, you can't even do that. Right, no one can change those numbers in your address without your private key. Right, nobody can. Right, only your private key has the ability to change the numbers in that database, and that is fundamentally a very, very important concept. is is essentially a state transition system. And if you're going to do away with any part of the system, you may as well say, let's do away with the whole system. If we do away with the users, the users are not going to care anymore. Fine then, 
the developers can be hijacked and they can start implementing features. They can inflate the supply if they want to, because the users don't care. They're just idiots. And they, they don't have the intelligence to figure this out for themselves. I would say, actually, the security of the network depends heavily on the users being informed, self-directed, independent thinkers. Because if they're not, then they might fall foul to this kind of, you know, this kind of politi political game playing that we're seeing right now. Yeah, I think that was just a great summary right there of why this is kind of aggravating to some people where it's like emotions get drawn high is because we see this as such a powerful, possible world changing revolution. And, you know, it's, it's just like you hear this sort of thing of like, well, let's just forget it and do this. And, you know, the same sort of thing, but just with a more inefficient way of doing it, it's aggravating. But, uh, you know, like the statement said from, uh, from that soul meetup group, hopefully these people will, uh, take in this information and change their mind and do the right thing. Yeah. So any final thoughts? James says he'll do whatever Chris tells him to do. Very funny. I see what you did there. See what you did there. I'm a thought leader. I'm a guru. If you pay me 0.1 BTC, I'll tell you what the future is going to be. And, uh, no, James, no think for no, yourself. Be your Don't be leader. a cock. Be your own thought Don't leader. Don't be a cock, James. No, you need thought leaders because you're too stupid, okay, to make up your own mind. Just follow the crowd, do whatever the loud voices say. Do well, just because S&P has an issue with leadership and they've decided, oh, leadership is the huge issue. To try and apply those ideals to Bitcoin. Like there's leaders here through independent thought. And I, I can't emphasize the importance of independent thought in this space. Yeah, because you know it doesn't sound sexy? Thought follower. Doesn't sound that good, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, did we want to bring up, have a discussion similar to what we were discussing yesterday in, in the chat room, Monkey? Or do you need more coffee? Maybe another time we want to, um, want to do that. If you can remind my brain we're what not, that not was, I we're think not, I we're can not on. <laughs> All right, let me, let me give you the gambit that I came in with. I, I came in partway through the conversation. It went on for a very long time. And we were talking about the block size debate. And I said, we're really having two conversations here. We're talking about how we make decisions on the upgrading of the network in the future. And we're talking about the particulars of what do we do in this particular upgrade situation? How do we you know, decide on what the block size should be? And those are two conversations. And to have this in, in a way that where you argue from first principles and you adhere to logic and you avoid things like ad hominem, no true Scotsman, all those kind of logical fallacies in order to have uh, a, a recondite, an, a, an erudite, sorry, debate that is informed, that is educated, you really have to make category distinctions. And that means category distinctions being separating all of the various topics into their right, right category and then discussing one at a time rather than trying to dilute the debate and, and ha actually having you know, argument across purposes and, and all kinds of things like that. So one of the things that I think somebody said to Mop, B2C Mop, who, Stephen, who used to come on here uh, at the beginning when we just launched the show, said that, look, when you got, got into Bitcoin, you signed up for a one megabyte block size. And I said, well, I don't think necessarily that you did. I think what you signed up for was a system of governance as it was at the time that you know you trusted these particular developers to make decisions on your behalf you presumably by buying this asset thought that the decisions in the previous have been the right ones otherwise why why were you buying I mean, generally people don't buy assets expecting them to go down in value so there is an implied trust there that you're you're trusting the, the bitcoin core developers to make good decisions and you let's argue are not a computer scientist so you have to trust that they're going to make reasonably good decisions but you also trust that because it's open source that other community members can inspect the code and that no foul play is is reasonably possible because you know people are going to spot it i don't think necessarily you signed up for the particular one megabyte block size i think you signed up for a, a way in which decisions can okay be yeah. jag my brain a bit and uh yeah i was actually the one that I said that 
but um, I, I didn't mean necessarily that, that you signed up for like the one megabyte block and then that's just it, but you, you signed up for a system that had a, a one megabyte block at the time with no guarantees that that's going to change. And just because it, it was a widely assumed, and, and I, don't, I don't even really think it was, it was it, it, a, a large group of people assumed, but I, I wouldn't say everybody did. But just because like a segment of people assume that's going to change doesn't necessarily mean it will. And just because you came into something that had a, a, the current state of affairs and assumed that affairs would change in a particular way doesn't really mean that you can expect that it will. Like ultimately, it, this is a, a disparate group of people that are just, it's like a mob. And the mob is just moving in the same direction. And you can't really have an expectation that that mob is just going to pack all their stuff up and start moving in the direction that you want them to, just because that's the direction you want the mob to move in. And, you know, ultimately, like, yes, a lot of people aren't really equipped to completely, like, make the informed decisions themselves. They are going to have to some degree, like, outsource that trust. But ultimately, like, this, is, this was the state of things when you got here. And if, if we can't all, if we can't get the entire mob on the same page to move in a different direction, well, it's going to keep moving in the direction that it is. And that leaves you with the choice, are you going to stick with that mob or are you going to break off and form your own mob? Yeah. And ultimately, yeah. No, no that, finish, that was finish your point. Well, it's pretty much like, you know, it's when, when I got here, like I, I had a whole slew of ideas on where this was going. And pretty much uh, at the end of the day, I arrived to a spectrum of possibilities. And for maybe the past two years or so, I have been open to the possibility that, you know, Bitcoin might not go the way I want it to. Like it, it, it very well could have just ballooned into PayPal 2.0. It could also have never gotten any upgrade like SegWit whatsoever and could have just potentially turned into a, a gold clearinghouse. Like, for, you know, for all we knew six months ago, SegWit wasn't going to come in. That's what it was going to be forever. And it would just turn into a, a waiting list where you would months to clear your digital gold through the house to somebody else. And that, that was a possibility. And like, ultimately, like people need to step back and realize that, you know, if we can't get everybody on the same page, then we have the status quo and that will evolve through not evolving in whatever way it will uh, and you either deal with that or you go and do something else with something else and i mean that's it's it's it might suck it, it might be hard for people to hear that and, and process that but that's just the reality of the situation well See, another another point i'd like to make is i think it will become very apparent in this network when we do need to actually increase that block size very apparent and we have SegWit, like we can scale up into this whole area now. And I think once we start reaching the upper bounds of SegWit, again, it will be very, very obvious that like this is what we need to do. Yeah. So a few things, uh, I thoughts that came to mind as you were talking, Shinobi, was I've met people in my life that are resistant to mess. And some might say chaos disorganization, but some of the brightest people, some of the most intelligent people I've met in my life are pretty messy, right? They live in this kind of, you know, professor's kind of lab and they've got all the mad scientists and it's this junk everywhere, but like the character Rick in Rick and Morty, right? Like his garage is like full of like junk and stuff, but it's not a mess in his head it, because he has a map and his, his brain is able to hold that information. Um, not just the, the array, he's not, you know, remembering it like a grid. He's remembering the paths, uh, you know, how, you know, this, this particular object relates to that object over there. And there's a certain resistance I see in this community to that kind of chaotic kind of, you know, 
intelligent way of organizing things because that's what we see in nature nature isn't organized like a grid it is actually quite chaotic and it is messy but it works it's always always beautiful and i think that's what there is i think there are certain people in this industry that just want things to be like top down because that's what they're used to and their brains like that because that's simple i can handle that i've got a heuristic for this i know this i'm more comfortable here Whereas when you like, if you're a business like Coinbase, you've got investors, you've got maybe a certain agenda. We actually met a former Coinbase developer tonight. Maybe we can talk about that another time. But it it kind of they don't want to leave their business in the hands of this, you know, chaotic, anarchic group of individuals that are making decisions that they don't deem in the interest of their growth strategy or their you know go to market or their you know, exit strategy with the Lambos and, and whatever that they, they've got pictured in their mind, right? The bro down. They, they, the, the anarchy significantly impacts their bro down, as Rick would say, <laughs> right? And so mm -hmm. that's how I would frame it. I'm not trying to give, deliver any answers here. I'm just saying that's how I picture this. Yeah, I'd say it's a, a very good breakdown of like, oof the different sides or the, the spectrum i guess you could say of how people are looking at this thing from different angles i mean james agrees with me saying he loves it when chris talks his bullshit thanks blah 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 aristotle there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's me um uh, yeah just for the record i really didn't like that picture if then if that person who made it is watching, I, was, I really didn't. Know. I was a bit I just looked at it and I was like, is that an insult? I can't really tell if he's just like joking around or whatever. But um so the other thing I wanted to mention, I'm just going through the, the chat to see if anyone's said anything intelligent. Apparently you haven't, you know, just being trolls today. Um oh uh, no, Paula, you did say that if you would actually stop using Bitcoin if someone was actually in charge. I, I'll, I'm leaving Bitcoin if someone becomes in charge. And she also says, um, I vote not to have a leader. Let's just continue fighting. Damn straight. Like, and this is something I was saying in the chat as well with, with Mop and, and maybe we should get him on actually, because I like hearing, you know, the other side of the debate um, is that we need a space for this. Like we need to accept a few things first of all bitcoin is open source that means that when you create an open source project you are surrendering the ability to control that project going forward that is something you just have to accept and second of all that the blockchain belongs to the commons it belongs to everybody so long as everyone has access to it they download it locally to their hard drive there's no copyright on the blockchain there's no patents in the code that generates that blockchain and as a result you can't stop somebody from forking and really, I think what Bitfinex have shown, um, you know, with this new chain split token contract in, in the last week or two, is that there has to be a way that you deal with a lot of these changes that are extraneous to the protocol itself. You can't do everything in the protocol, right? The code itself is not enough. You need actually an environment around that code that is conducive to the improvement of that code, right? And that means that if somebody decides to take the UTXO set, the Genesis block and all, and say, right, we're going to fork at this block height, either prospectively or retrospectively, then you need a mechanism, a social mechanism of how do we deal with this now? So for Bitfinex, that means we need a liquidity pool before the fork happens so that we can ease into it. So that all those margin positions can, can be settled out ahead of time to make sure they've got the right amount of collateral on balance to make sure that you know people don't get wrecked to make sure lenders get their coins as well and the margin loans can also get paid so there's there's that element of it and also there's the forward pricing mechanism that you get with the market when you actually list these tokens there is a way for the market to look the miners as well that can actually see what they think the, the market thinks the, the price is worth and you do in bitcoin as with in with ordinary politics, you have the incumbency problem, right? Which is that if you're an incumbent, it's your, if you're in a position of power already, if you're a president or prime minister or king, it's yours to lose, not your opponents to win. A lot of opponents run for office and they think that they're gonna win because they're so clever, but it's actually not you. 
that wins the race. It's the incumbent that loses it. And as it is with Bitcoin Core, is that they are extant. They exist already in the space. They've had all this reputation. Everyone follows them. People will generally stick with what they know more than what they don't. And there are people that blindly follow block, you know, uh, Bitcoin Core and uh, other members of uh, Blockstream and so forth. They, they think that you know, Adam Back is very, very smart. They're always going to listen to him no matter what. And there are also people that do the same on the other side of this debate. So, you know, when you talk about it, I think you do need a framework, an environment, as I say, that, that surrounds the code, not just the code itself. We can't automate everything away. Yeah, I mean, it's we're human beings at the end of the day interacting with something. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can't remove the human being from a human thing <laughs> like and i and really if somebody found a way to i don't think i'd want to <laughs> now did anyone else have any points to make because i've got another rant yeah go for it man all right so the other thing that came up in the conversation the other day was there, there are pre-existing problems if you want to understand bitcoin you to understand Bitcoin is to understand the historical context with which Bitcoin emerged. You have to understand that Bitcoin came along not in 1997 when it was technically feasible to exist. It came along in 2009. It came along right as social media was taking off. And it came really at the end of a burgeoning uh, software as a service industry. Now, let me take you back to the 90s if any of you were using uh, you know, dial up back then, or any of you were using software, you know, quite regularly. You will remember that if you wanted to uh, install an update, or if the developers rolled out an update, you would normally be sent a floppy disk or a CD, or you'd have to go out actually go and buy the CD. Uh, and you maybe you'd have a serial number that would give you an entitlement to an upgrade. Now, in that model, it was a pull based model. Now, as a developer, and you work in user experience and user design, you have this concept of end user compliance. And end user compliance is, well, as a designer, I design a product and I build it to a specification based on, normally, based on what I perceive as being the goals of the end user, right? So I have to anticipate ahead of time the, the concerns, the fears, the, the desires of these people, remembering all the while that the user really just exists in my head. I never really know what the user wants, but I have some idea in my mind. But what I have that the user doesn't have is I have expertise. I have things that, uh, that they do not know, and they presumably wish to outsource a lot of that expertise. In Greek, it would be the episteme, okay, the, the knowledge. And uh, the, the end user would have uh, what was called the doxa, right? That means the opinion. And so they would have an opinion. They would go, they would look through the array of products that were on offer and they would form an opinion. They would say, okay, I think this, this product is right. Based on the episteme, the knowledge of the engineer who would craft it, who would you know, spend their lives. And that's because as an engineer, I dedicate my life to this specialism and the end user can go off and have other specialisms. They can often become a teacher, a plumber, a police officer, whatever they want. Now, you are not always going to get in engineering software development and user compliance. And in particular, in the area of public key cryptography and security, end user compliance is very important. Not so bad if it's desktop publishing, someone makes a mistake, well, too bad, they have to print out that document again, and they have to use different settings next time. And we all remember how bad desktop publishing was in the 90s, like you were there for hours just trying to print stuff out and it would never quite fit on the page correctly and you'd always have to set up. Terrible user experience. When you mess up user experience in security-based things, like you know, with your PIN number on a banking site or with your Trezor today, Ledger wallets, the hardware wallets, right? If that user experience is broken, bad things happen. People start to lose money. And when you're building, when you're building software all the time, it requires the consent you have this ongoing negotiation with the end user in terms of the intentions that you anticipate as an engineer, deploying that and then executing it according to what you understood at the time uh, uh, designing it. 
right? And those two things don't always match. Now, what happened with software as a service was that instead of having to send out a floppy disk or a CD every time a developer wanted to roll out an update, instead, the software was all hosted on a server in the cloud. And people would just log in, and then updates could be passively rolled out without the user having any clue. So now, you weren't consenting to a snapshot of the software. You weren't consenting to this version of Photoshop, right? The, you know, Photoshop CS or whatever, right? Because I really liked Photoshop CS, actually. I didn't like some of the improvements they were putting in later versions. So I just stuck with it for the longest time, didn't upgrade. And whereas with the SaaS model, what you're consenting to actually is a product. You're not consenting to a piece of software, a snapshot. You're consenting to a product that is always subject to change. It's fluid and it might change in the future. But how do you as an engineer, how do you have that trust and that relationship with your end user? If you're just able to deploy updates like terms of adhesion, in regular terms of service on websites where you know the company has to take some measure to make you aware of changes to those terms of service but we all know that we don't really read them and that's kind of like this unspoken thing but as an engineer and in particular in security you can't just wave that off you can't just say okay it's fine for you to slip changes in and especially when it comes to bitcoin bitcoin came in at 2009 as i said it came in well after software as a service had become you know very well established and this idea that we can just and this is what i'm hearing from the node to x's and i'm hearing it from people like roger Ver, is this passive rollout model of like we'll just roll out the changes and the users don't really have to understand how this works you know twenty thousand dollar full nodes like no discussion yeah shanine's saying in the chat no discussion like let's just push this out because users the, the assumption the underlying assumption is the users are too stupid to understand this, right? I don't, I, I can't, I, am I mischaracterizing it? I don't think I'm mischaracterizing it. No, what other assumption am I supposed to make? That's the exact impression I get is that they just think the users are incredibly dumb. In my experience, uh, that's not the way I've seen uh, large populations of, uh, of the world react to, to fairly complex things. Um, it may seem on the outside or, or at first like they don't understand or, or something like that. Maybe they just don't give a shit because they're so upset that it doesn't work, you know, and they're just getting by because they can still get by for now. Yeah, and there was a great video from uh, Andreas Antonopoulos today because um, someone asked him at a meetup in Bali um, whether Bitcoin is a good investment vehicle. Like, is it a good, like she, she used this phrase, um, put your Bitcoins to work as in, you know, you know yield and all that. And um, his reply was that Bitcoin is not a get rich quick scheme. It's a get free scheme as in get freedom. Right. <laughs> and so I feel like, you know, if you're not, if you're not on board with the get free scheme, then, you know, you're basically just a software as a service model. Right. I want to pick up on what Paula is saying. She's like, yeah, I know, Chris, I liked Mosaic on Windows 3.1. Why do we all have to upgrade? And it's really about consenting to the upgrade. And I'm not talking about operating systems either. I'm talking about, in particular, your money and making sure that those updates can't just be slipped in by the back door by a group of developers. By making it opt in rather than opt out, you're changing that relationship between the end user and the developer and that affects the way uh, you know things happen with end user compliance right so the reason why bitcoin core have decided to go with the soft fork approach isn't so much because they all disagree with the notion that we should have bigger base block sizes i think a lot of them have said that they do want bigger base block sizes in the long run um, that was one of the the disappointments for me in this debate was that it was just so binary and it wasn't granular and we didn't actually say okay this person is an individual and they think this and they may agree with a base block size increase on these conditions and that you know there was no continuum there it was just like you were either a big blocker or you were a small blocker and what we're talking about is that when software is rolled out that the users be given a choice about what features they want and they, they certainly shouldn't be forced into having certain features that they don't that they they certainly wouldn't live with right 
And with software as a service, you can certainly hide that. When you are forced to deliver you know, source code and binaries, the reason why Core chose to go with this backwards compatibility model was that it gave everyone as much time as was technically possible whilst keeping the network under reasonably good healthy conditions after all. I mean, we were told that the block size was going to you know, kill the chain and we were told that if we didn't update immediately, upgrade immediately to bigger blocks that, you know, or, you know hell would break loose and we wouldn't have any, it would be a nightmare. But here we are today and we have many empty blocks being mined and sometimes it's actually quite quiet on the blockchain. The mempool is pretty, pretty empty. So when you, when you do that, what the engineers are trying to do at the moment is they're trying to get a good balance and they're trying to get the balance between what the network needs and what the end user needs. It's about listening to wants, but providing the needs, because actually users don't know what they want. I mean, they may think they do, and they'll certainly be vocal about it, but they won't necessarily be very good at knowing or understanding what they need, and that's because they don't have the epistemic. They don't have the knowledge. They're not engineers. They're not specialists in their field. So, Monkey. Yeah, and, and like also, like that... There's also like a, a moral aspect, I, I would say, in a lot of developers' minds. And like, I, I think most of them just feel on a moral or ethical level, they just don't have the right to impose anything on the users or, or decide for them. I, I think they, they look at their role in this ecosystem more as somebody offering users choices. And when it comes to something like a hard fork, that there, there really is no way to do that except through imposition on some level. And I just think most of them just view that as morally reprehensible. Like it's antithetical to, to that mentality of offering users choices. Yeah, it is a moral. It is a moral issue. Absolutely. And I think business people find it very difficult to make moral decisions um, or even not moral decisions this ethical discussions are often just resistant in you know they're just completely anathema in a, in a business discussion um, I've had a number of meetings with startups before where you know I've gone in and they've asked me for help or whatever and I've sat in on the meeting and I'm like but is this actually the right thing to do and I even had one instance where the CEO Actually, it wasn't even for me he was talking to. He was talking to a lawyer who had been hired for this business. And the lawyer raised an ethical concern um, about what they were doing with the user's data and all that kind of stuff. And the CEO turned around and said, don't give me that moral bullshit. Or I don't, I don't have time, actually. He said, I don't have time for this moral bullshit. I've got a meeting to go to. I've got to speak to investors. You know, I don't, I don't have time for this. Just, just build what what I've said that we need to build because this is what the investors want and what the investors wanted of course was you know privacy violating features that you know gathers much data on the user because that's what they can sell on to the next guy so it is it is a moral discussion like as an engineer right, as an ethical engineer particularly if it's Bitcoin you're voluntary you you don't want to violate that trust that you have with your users um, and I think it is a violation of trust when you start to implement features, you know, secretly that aren't necessarily for the benefit of those users. And Paula says, I'm okay with two megabyte blocks. It's a good compromise. I don't want eight megabytes, but I do want SegWit. Can't we have two X, but let Core run it, then everyone will be happy. Paula, you're like, you're one of the best, best trolls ever. And you're, you're just, all these points you're making are just really good. I really like the way you're phrasing it. Yeah, can't we just like compromise, guys? Can't we just like monkey? Come on, two megabytes, come on. That's, that's not unreasonable, is it? Well, we have that's it. Reasonable. Like people just need to upgrade the SegWit. I mean, like blockchain info, like earlier with, with that blog post, I was legitimately pissed off. They, like their node, they're still running off of a 0.07 node like and this is a fact the last time that their node crashed their mempool dropped to zero uh, it escapes me at the moment but one of the the latest core releases updated to actually save the mempool on disk so that it's not dropped to zero during a crash or a reboot theirs didn't so as a statement of objective fact their node is prior to that 
they're just hacking stuff on top of this older version. Like they have not even implemented SegWit yet because they're wasting time working on Bcash and this nonsense with this fork. Like they are one of the most incompetent businesses in this space and they could very easily push us a big way towards having two megabyte blocks right now with SegWit. But instead of that, they are pushing this corporatist attitude where the users should just shut up and, and do what they say. And we, we have two megabytes right now. It's right there. It's unlocked, waiting to be used. And the only thing that needs to happen is businesses actually need to get off their ass and implement the thing waiting for them. But they don't. And it, like, it legitimately pisses me off. It, it's, it's an insult to, to most of the user base in this ecosystem. I can't. So all their wallets are really running on point zero seven code. Is that right? Yeah, the, the, their back end node is an old version of core that they're just hacking things on top of. And they haven't actually updated to the most recent version of core. And if you really want to be a, nit, a nitpicker, I mean, you could argue that this is negligence in protecting consumer funds because like, they're not using secure tested software to do so. They're just hacking things on top of an old implementation with old consensus rules. Yeah, and I mean, I I do not envy the experience that their um, customer service is going to have because I have experienced their service on a very minor issue in the past, and they are absolutely terrible. They don't get back to you. They ignore you. It, I like. I don't even want to know what's going to happen with all this forking business when they have customers coming to them, like not understanding what they're supposed to do. And yeah, that's going to be a train wreck. Great. Well, this has been yep. a very lively discussion. What do we want to do? I'll just uh, make one comment about this whole discussion as far as like open source and closed source, you know, like because uh, I was a kid playing around with open source software and I didn't recognize that, you know, the difference really once it happened as far as like rolling upgrades that I wasn't paying attention to. And, you know, nowadays we see so many things where that rolling update has put in some backdoor where people's information are being spied on. And, you know, that security, like you were talking about, it's, it's already been broken in a lot of ways with a lot of different things on the internet. And I feel like whenever I found Bitcoin, it was like, oh, here's this way back to that, that where it was my choice. And uh, I didn't even really recognize it until it was there. And I said, oh, you know, it really shocked me. I said, and that's when I just got wrapped up in the space and fell back in. And I really love that this open source environment is still around. Well, we're getting a bit emotional there, Rick. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, like I've seen absolute authority take control in a couple of different places. You know, I was in the army and it's deadly. It's deadly. I mean, people die whenever absolute authority is human because it will screw up. And I mean, you know, the absolute authority of Bitcoin is math. And I like that. And I love the fact that it, the upgrades are, they take years of peer review and design and then you know it's my choice still whether or not I want to implement it and I can spend my time researching all about it before I want to do that at any point in time I want to and so yeah it's important it's definitely something that kind of hits me hard because of you know like I said that absolute authority is dangerous one thing I've been worried about with that in particular is uh, uh, potential vulnerability to open source projects going forward here in the future if Bitcoin start, it continues to, to do what it's been doing, right? Um, I'm worried about that kind of sucking a lot of our open source dev talent to putting more eyes on Bitcoin and making sure, you know, it's in good shape. And I worry about other open source libraries and projects potentially um, getting undermined by some of these big corporations and, and other things under the guise of like corporate espionage uh, which, you know, their departments sometimes are fluxing, right? Uh, maybe I, maybe it wouldn't be so crazy for some of them to actually go out and try and infiltrate open source projects to, to try and get them to, to, to 
stir up issues in the community. And I'm really worried that backdoors could get snuck in that way and just just general snippets of malicious code. So I think going forward, it's going to be even more critical to to be very cautious and careful with our open source libraries and, you know, making sure that people are contributing code are people we know and have talked to and discussed with, even if they're anonymous, that doesn't really seem to matter. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, they're really good points. And as Rick says, you know, I've, I've, Rick, I've heard you talking in the chat before about um, specific, uh, quite horrific stories you've told us. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, Rick is very sincere in um, what he's saying, like uh, absolute authority is, is very dangerous. Um, and uh, I think what you're talking about there is a totalizing view world where actually there is no relationship really anymore between you as an engineer and the user. It's just a one directional, like I'm just giving you this and there's no care. There's no consideration. You're not even really thinking about the intentions of the user anymore. You're now thinking about the intentions of, the company that you represent or the government if you're working if it's a government agency so guys it's been a very lively debate we've we've running over one hour now do we want yeah, to turn the lights on man the sunset yeah. <laughs> yeah uh yeah great discussion good chat as well going on in, in in the chat room and um any final words before we sign off uh I think I think we covered most of the important things. Just uh, you know, keep keep being Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners. Like the shit's not gonna get any easier. Oh, we didn't mention the Szechuan sauce. Should we just briefly mention someone in the chat has mentioned it? But if we pay the yeah, debt to Szechuan yeah. sauce, that would solve everything. <laughs> would you sell your car <laughs> for some Szechuan sauce? No, I mean, so, uh, so absolute, absolute power incentivized by money is dangerous. Can you imagine absolute power incentivized with Szechuan sauce? I, I think, I know, it right? would, yeah, it'd, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be real, real, real scary, Janine. You know, it's, 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 it's some na nasty, nasty stuff you're, you're talking about getting into there. <laughs> Genius. What was the story I overheard today about someone was using Szechuan sauce as like, a currency or something what was that about Somebody they were like traded their car for one packet of Szechuan sauce <laughs> well not just one car actually i've seen two separate stories listing two different cars actually exchanged for Szechuan sauce at this point one being some audi and the other being a volkswagen golf <laughs> I feel like I really See, missed out. I saw the line. I just left it. <laughs> yeah, because you've got two sides to this. On the one hand, you have apparently service people at McDonald's being attacked when <laughs> when people don't get the sauce. And then on the other hand, you have crazy people trading their cars for it. So Yeah, you know, when I went there, there was a huge line and actually a security guard came out to tell us that they ran out of the sauce. You know, he had a baton and everything. He was ready to beat some folks down if they started attacking him, I guess. I like this. Uh, Fubar Gorch says, uh, how come Rick and Morty fans do dig Szechuan sauce so much, but sugar chicken didn't make a dent in their psyche? I mean, I don't know. Well, it's, you know, cause, cause, like Rick, Rick told us how like awesome it was, and you know, we, we, we just, we, we just needed to taste the awesome. <laughs> yeah, and really, it was all just to symbolise how meaningless the life was. Um, it wasn't even meant as like a serious thing. But I love the way that the whole community thought that it was really serious thing and decided to queue up outside of McDonald's everywhere. All right, guys, look, that's enough for one day. Thank you very much for joining us. This is. Uh, it's uh, been our first week, actually. Tomorrow will be our, our episode uh, five of season two. And thank you very much for your continued support. If you have enjoyed what you've seen here today, you may like and subscribe. But remember, only if you want to. Bye for now.